Uh, Richie Holton does come from Dunedin, so I'll get it right this time. Uh, he's the director of the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Research Unit, which conducts the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, uh, one of the most detailed studies of human health and development ever undertaken. Uh, this uh, began in 1972-73. Uh, it's a study of 1,037 babies. In fact, I can remember when it started. I, I hate to tell you all, I was uh, at medical school when it began. Um, and it studies members um, uh, uh, following them up since birth at age three, and then every two years to the age of 15, and then ages 18, 21, 26, and 32. Uh, the latest assessment phase at age 38, so that will tell you how old I am, um, was completed in March uh, 2012. Uh, for each follow-up phase, the study members are brought to the Dunedin unit where they undergo numerous assessments and measures of their health and development. Recent assessments have included a broad range of studies in the psychosocial, behavioural medicine and biomedical research areas. The age 38 assessment phase was an outstanding success with 95% of the surviving study members being assessed. It is planned to next see the study members at age 45. Now, I don't know whether you're going to talk about this study, but it does sound uh, really fascinating. So over to you. Thanks, Janice. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Janice. And also thanks for setting it up beautifully in your opening comments, uh, where you said that, and now I can say it, more than 30 years ago when you started medical school, uh, it was well known that people with mental health problems uh, experienced uh, earlier mortality. The degree, extent, severity of the morbidity was probably less well known, but the fact that it was well known it was conventional wisdom 30 plus years ago. And it's still a problem, is a scandal. I mean, it's one of the big scandals, not just within the mental health world. Uh, and it's an equity issue, but it's a whole lot of other issues wrapped in. Uh, so, um, you know, this meeting was timely 30 years ago. Uh, so I want to enrage you a bit, uh, if you can just think about that for a second, or ten. Uh, when you leave at the end of, the, end of today, um, uh, it's appropriate that your blood pressure is raised about this issue. And you need to get out there and slam dunk some people about it. Uh, no back foot stuff, um, not warranted anymore. Uh, so you can be strident. Um, be um, well armed with data, of course, but be, you could be strident in your delivery. It's well justified. Now, when Helen asked me to talk, she said, can you look at the earlier talks and try and compliment them somehow? <laughs> <laughs> this is how it really works. Um, and so, um, I've had a busy few weeks, so I didn't really look at the earlier talks, but I was guessing that the earlier talks might have spoken about uh, adults with... Um, uh, mental health problems suffering from an excess of physical uh, difficulties and problems. And that was in fact what we've heard about. Right, so you're talking about an association, we don't know which way the, the causal arrow goes, and we don't know much about mechanism. Could be behaviour, could be access to, um, uh, equitable access to healthcare. Um, it might even be a direct causal relationship between the process of ageing and mental health problems. We don't know that yet. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about mechanism, but what I am going to do is bring the lens further back uh, in the life course. Uh, and I want, I hope, to convey to you that mental health uh, is potentially an antecedent variable to poor physical health that begins very early in life. And therefore, your intervention options include real prevention or even preemption of huge amounts of physical morbidity, which is easy to sell the finance minister, much easier, you know this, don't you, than mental health problems. So there's a real opportunity here. Now the reason I can do this is because, as Janice mentioned, I direct now the, uh, 
the need in the study. I'm not going to go into this. I've only got a, uh, a few minutes, and I, I like talking about the study, and it's usually about half an hour before I've even cleared my throat, so I'm going to try and rush through this bit. Um, but just notice on the right-hand side uh, that we've managed to keep virtually the whole cohort intact after four decades. Now, that's not to show off as a researcher. Um, that's a credit to uh, the study members. We work hard, of course, but it's a credit to the study members uh, who are scattered all around the world. Only 30% um, uh, still live in Dunedin. 25% live outside New Zealand now. About 10% in the Northern Hemisphere. We have to bring them back to the Dunedin Research Unit every so many years. And, of course, that gives us wonderful uh, uh, control, uh, experimental control, over the types of assessments we do in an epidemiological sample. So we just don't ask them questions or ring them up or do catty interviews or send postal questions out. We bring them back and subject them to all sorts of really detailed physical assessments. Uh, we draw blood. Uh, I'll, I'll run through in the next slide or two what we've covered. Uh, but when we've got them back in a Dunedin research unit, we've got them in, in standard conditions and we can do stuff that most longitudinal studies or life course studies like these cannot. And that sets us up to do studies of the relationship between mental health and uh, physical uh, conditions quite nicely. Um, the 95% is important from a science perspective. Won't th surprise you at all to know that the major threat to the value of these sorts of enterprises is what they call non-random loss to follow-up. That is, the people that drift away first, hardest to find, hardest to get back in, are not a random group. Oh, if they only were. <laughs> you, know, you start with a huge number and just let it whittle down over time. But no, they're not. They're mul they, these are people that are hard, hard to find. They are people within whom multiple difficulties aggregate. And they're exactly the ones that last 20 or 30% that you really want to keep in a study like this. Because they then flesh the picture out so you can say with some confidence that you have the full range of exposures in a general population sample through the life course and therefore capture the full range of possible outcomes. All right? So that's what its real value is. It gives us confidence in our causal inferences. Notice how careful I am with these words. Because it's a correlational design. Right? It's not an RCT. Mind you, RCTs are not the gold standard for does sexual abuse harm people's long-term trajectories. Okay? You don't get uh, ethical permission to randomly allocate kids to sexual abuse or not. So these types of studies are probably as good as they're ever going to get. And so you need to build on some design features, and we've tried to do this uh, quite a lot, that allow you to strengthen your causal inferences. There's been a number of questions about um, third variable things, and we have, because uh, we've got a multidisciplinary database, the capacity to adjust for most things, depending on what we're looking at. Now, just quickly give you a, a flavour of the range. What we're talking about today is mental health, top right-hand side. But you can see we've covered the physical end of the spectrum as well, quite nicely. And this is programmatic research. So from five or from seven, we'd be measuring, for example, oral health. The first time the dentist came along, this is what you can do when you're back in the unit. The dentist comes along and actually measures people's mouths. So at 38, you're getting gum disease, tooth loss, caries, tooth by tooth, as well as plaque samples. Uh, we take, oh, we've got some uh, family history study data. There's now 8,000 um, family members of our main cohort members. Uh, we have measures of, of their health history. We're also doing a third generation study. First born three year olds and now 15. The, sec the first born three year olds is not about the three year olds, it's about the parenting of our study members of their three year olds. What goes into good or bad parenting? Um, a number of blood-based studies are possible. Right? This is just to set the scene to say that the Dunedin study is a wealth of broad data, in-depth measurement, and allows us to begin to get some traction on this issue of why is it that people with mental health problems and long histories of such, why do they end up with high levels of morbidity? No matter where you look, because birds of a feather flock together, whether you have cardiovascular, uh, metabolic, uh, poor gums, um, uh, exposure to SDIs, etc. And all they all tend to aggregate. So why is that? When in the life course does this relationship kick in or first emerge? And that's important because it tells you with whom and when and how you might intervene. Okay? So I've got three or four slides I'm going to throw up there. There's not meant to be a consistent narrative about this other than um, if you think about how early you can intervene, you'll start looking back towards childhood. You won't wait 
until the classic horses out the barn. All right? Um, if at the end you wish me to weave it together in a more coherent framework, I can in terms of where the study's going next because we're on the precipice of beginning to understand different differential rates of pace of ageing. And ageing is one of the ubiquitous risk factors for non-communicable non diseases. Heart disease, cancer, all that stuff. And we're beginning to show that there are earlier antecedent variables to different differential pace of ageing in early midlife, including mental health histories, that can predict membership of rapid ageing. Because we're all 38 at this point, or all 42. So we're controlled for age. So I can bring that together at the end if you wish. But just to throw uh, some food for thought out there. Um, WHO is not useful for much, but it's useful for this. Um, it's done the Global Burden of Disease uh, study, which has ranked in terms of disability-adjusted life years, uh, the ma major disease or disorder or condition categories. And there you have it. The first two you'll be very familiar with, of course. As, and they, you tend to think of those, and there are exceptions, but you tend to think of those as being problems of the latter part or the second half of the life course. Yeah? That's fair enough? Um, what about the first, or the third? Early. First half of the life course, right? How early? How early? Conception. <laughs> Come along with your DSM. DSM-6 will have something like conviction. Um, <laughs> No, no. Well, not bad though, you get the drift. Um, so mental health. Um, so we did a study, or done a number of studies, that show that if you ask adults about their um, mental health problems, and we only restrict our uh, window to the previous 12 months because there's decay in accuracy of reporting much beyond 12 months. If you ask about the previous 12 months, in adulthood, be it 26 when this study was done, or 32 or 38 even, uh, they will report X um, uh, range of uh, disorders or conditions. And if you look back in those people's histories, what you'll see is that very few of them have a de novo disorder or condition. And this uh, nails it down. Most disorders, 75%, so 75%, almost actually four out of five people with an adult psychiatric diagnosis had evidence of a disorder in the juvenile years. It may not be the same one, but they had a psychiatric diagnosis, a la the DSM of the day, using a structured diagnostic instrument uh, to assess. Uh, if you go back to 15, what was it, 70 per cent? Right? So the lion's share of people with an adult psychiatric problem have had signs, symptoms, and met criteria for a disorder much earlier in their life. In other words, there aren't adult psychiatric disorders, and I hope I'm offending the adult psychiatrists in the, in the room when I say this. They are juvenile disorders growing up. All right? Uh, and the, the distinctions, the, the, the turf issues in psychiatry are nonsense. They're just turf issues. Um, they have their own serious politics. In that sense, they're serious. Uh, but in terms of what data tell you, most Psych adult psychiatric difficulties or mental health problems have very early onset in various forms. Now, by itself, that tells you something very interesting. That is, if you were able to intervene in adolescence, before, before the end of adolescence, effectively, you might remove up to half of the adult psychiatric burden. Well, remember, that's number three in the world in terms of burden. That's an appreciable... Now, of course, that's a theoretical high, and you're never going to get near that. But even if you just did um, one-tenth, that's an appreciable reduction in overall burden across the life course, savings for government, savings of human misery for individuals and families far out, and communities. Um, so that should gird everyone's loins about why they do what they do with mental health um, uh, issues. I mean, it's incredibly important. Now, what about its relationship to physical health? Because if you're just stuck with mental health, you've got a hugely strong case. Because we all talk about investment these days. For investing in mental health early. But if you broaden your horizon to include physical morbidity, if there's a 
co if there's a sequential comorbidity situation here, in other words, mental health problems proceed, or mental health or behaviours that are aligned with mental health issues proceed or antedate physical problems, you've got, you've got even a stronger argument with the treasurer or the finance minister to invest some of your meagre resources into mental health because it improves mental health outcomes and, and, a, and the obvious correlates, but also physical problems that go well beyond those that people normally think about. Booze and drugs. Now this really, this was a uh, paper we did in another context which was, um, and it's called Every Parent's Worry. In fact, I've got a 14-year-old girl that probably partly explains it uh, in anticipation. Um, it, you know, is it okay to let 15-year-olds um, get on the turps or smoke a bit of dope? Now, the conventional wisdom um, when we sort of went down this path about 10 years ago, a little um, more recent than that, was that actually it's not probably a real problem so long as it's not excessive. Um, you know, it's really those naughty kids, not our kids, those naughty kids <laughs> that have real problems. And their use of substances is just part of that constellation of bad behaviour that comes with being naughty. All right? And if you had the good kids um, getting, having a few drinks and um, uh, maybe you know, playing with a bit of dope, whatever, um, it's not going to make a, long, a huge, bit of, huge amount of difference in their life course, right? Kind of reasonably attractive intuitively. I mean, I guess my money was on that. This is why it's good to do research, um, to be found wrong. Um, nothing better than being found wrong. Um, from, you know, from the inside, it, it is quite a thrill to be, um, you have your hunch completely blown out of the water. Because what we found was, we did something clever here called propensity matching. Don't worry about the details too much. Uh, if you just look at me for a second, if you can stand that. <laughs> um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. Because propensity matching is this thing where you basically take people's propensity to be on, in this case, that naughty trajectory. Right? So conduct disordered kids from very early on. Um, and then match them uh, for um, a set of variables with people that aren't on those trajectories and hold that constant, effectively. Right? So you take out, you control away, you adjust for that propensity. Now what you see um, is on the left-hand side of that slide, as you have, see, no early exposure to substances. It's mainly alcohol, I must say. Only 15% of the Dunedin study people way back then had used cannabis. Um, and you look at those that were exposed early, that's by 15 versus not, and you can see there's a difference in terms of the, the likelihood of ending up with substance dependence by age 32, having herpes, 32, being pregnant before 21, leaving school with no educational qualifications, and having a number of criminal convictions. Um, and those odds ratios range from, if I'm eyeballing it here, from about just under two to five. All right, so um, the first pass was, yeah, if we just take the population as a whole um, and look at the long-term risks of getting into substances early, it's bad, including some physical, bad physical health outcomes here. Uh, herpes infection, for example. After we adjust, that is, we expect it to go away, right? If we're a subscriber to the good kids are okay hypothesis. But what you see there, it didn't matter, like a, um, a material difference. What is the take home from that? Well, hitting subs using substances at that period of uh, development when your brain's undergoing massive change in its architecture, right? So there's a, all the, um, oh, I'm getting a sign now, I've got to speed up. Um, all, all the well-used pathways are laid, being laid down and it's trimming away all the non-used pathways. High sensitivity, using substances may set you up to have some bad outcomes. Probably there's behavioural mediation there as well. Right, so you can't get away with using substances without some risk, whether or not you've been on a bad trajectory from um, the time you're in kindergarten. Now, whipping through the next thing. Oh, bad behaviour. We're talking about bad behaviour. Okay, so... Antisocial behaviour that emerges early in life and persists over time, that's life course persistent antisocial behaviour, results in a bunch of bad things, mental health uh, problems, bad relationships and criminality, but a whole bunch of negative physical things by the time you're in your 30s. Look at those multipliers. So everyone recognises life course persistent antisocial individuals, 5% of the population account for 50% of all the bad stuff, really important priority policy-wise, yet the costs associated with them are probably a massive underestimate 
Look at the physical morbidity. Social isolation, not um, a mental health problem, but associated often. Childhood social isolation, in fact. I'm going to have to rush through this. Um, just, in fact, I'll, don't look at that, look at me again. <laughs> what we did, we took a measure of between 5 and 11 of the degree of uh, social isolation experienced by our children. Ratings from parents and from school teachers at 5, 7, 9 and 11. So 8 ratings put into one measure and people range from high to low in terms of how isolated they were. Those in the top quartile were at about a 40% increased risk uh, for, uh, for cardiovascular disease by their mid-twenties. After you control for, and this is what's in that slide, um, other negative uh, risk factors in childhood, after you control for negative health risk factors in the adulthood, and after you control for risk behaviours, adolescent risk behaviours, that was robust to multiple adjustments. So being isolated um, is a risk factor for poor, poor cardiovascular health. But that's in childhood. That's in the first ten years. You don't have to wait till someone walks into your GP practice. Finally, self-control. Now, self-control, if you're into the mental, um, um, infant mental health um, um, movement, uh, is uh, at, uh, it's like temperament. It's baby personality. And what we've done recently uh, is we've done the marshmallow test properly. All right? So there'll be something in the list in the next week or the week after about the marshmallow test. Um, and so we did the marshmallow test properly. We didn't use marshmallows, though. We just got people to observe our children at 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. We had people observe, had them self-report, had parents, teachers, and so on. We traded a single scale. And self-control is this trade that's normally distributed. You know the bell curve and the population. So we asked, at age 32, the top, look at the top slide, we asked... Um, a whole bunch of questions and measured directly people's gum disease. We took measures of their glycated hemoglobin. We've got lipid measures. We've got blood pressure. We've got cardiorespiratory submaximal fitness tests. It goes on and on and on. And we created an omnibus, comp oh, sorry, I should say, composite measure for poor physical health with all these direct high quality measures. Now look what happens if you have poor self-control during your childhood and uh, we look at multiple indicators of poor physical health 25 years later. Now, top left-hand side <coughs> is the quintile that had the lowest level of self-control. The next diamond is the next quintile. So we divided the group into five 20% blocks. You with me? So quintiles along the bottom. So bottom right-hand side is uh, highest levels of self-control, best health. And it's a graded relationship. Okay, it's not like just one end of the spectrum that you've got to worry about. There's no point at which you cannot benefit in terms of physical health, in terms of developing stronger self-control as a child, probably as an adult as well. I mean, I've got great self-control at work, but at 10 o'clock at night, I cruise past the fridge. <laughs> it's a finite resource, so we can all benefit from trying to strengthen it over time. But... Critically here, you have the roots of all... Oh, there's a whole bunch of other things. Here's adult substance problems, same graded relationship, self or, or other reported. You've got adult wealth, people, uh, a greater relationship again, wealth outcomes, credit ratings, criminal convictions, positive parenting, all in, all in a direction. Low self-control, worse outcomes. By the way, people have asked us, are these people really uptight? You know, are they kind of like, they may be healthy in all these outcomes, but they're really boring. Uh, and they have no fun. And so there's life satisfaction, just to reassure you. And it makes sense. It makes sense with all these other good outcomes that you actually be pretty satisfied with their life. So this self-control construct, um, and this is by way of example, is one of um, a small set of predictors that are identifiable early in life, and if you did something to modify self-control, this is a set of skills you can learn. It's always how I construct it. A set of skills you can learn from early childhood onwards. Uh, it's a set of skills you can learn, and that may modify life trajectory so you end up with less physical health problems down the track. Uh, now, our stuff is what you call right-hand censored. Right? We've only gone up to 38. Now, we're getting some prices put on all these trajectories and being in these risk groups, and the numbers that are coming through, we've got an economist finally, and we're using an administrative data set from all the ministries we can get hold of in New Zealand. We've got really good cost data. These 
tra cross trajectories, just in terms of the accountants' um, uh, take on this, are phenomenal. Right, so mental health or behavioural health, more broadly, is incredibly important for New Zealand's GDP. As well as just being incredibly important for people um, with those issues um, and to address this terrible scandal uh, that has been uh, left to run unchecked until very recently. And to Poe, fantastic. Good on you for leading this.